Yep, so I'm a colonel in the Army, I'm currently stationed out here in Hawaii at Tripler Army Medical Center, but I am transitioning uh, to retirement. So that's why I didn't post any specific institutions other than where I'm an associate professor, which is at the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences located in Bethesda. I've also posted my Gmail email address because I am not going to be checking my um, military Outlook account very much or very often. And uh, in a few short months, it will be completely deactivated. All right. So some lecture rules um, just to keep things moving and on track. Uh, everybody should be on mute and put your questions in the chat. So when I get to the question slide, I'll go through the questions that have been posted and try to answer them as best as I can. My goal is to have about a 50 minute lecture, 10 minutes for questions, small talk, bad jokes, whatever you want. Because I am active duty, I just need to put a disclosure slide that any views expressed are my own not the Department of the Army or the Department of Defense. I don't have any conflict of interest. Uh, no commercial support was received. And in fact, Adobe Connect has been um, the bane of my morning, but that's okay. I'm also not gonna talk about any off-label products. Um, it's beyond the intended scope of the presentation. So the learning objectives, to have a basic understanding of the key elements of the immune system, um, to understand innate versus adaptive immunity, um, talk a little bit about humoral versus cell mediated immunity, and then dive deep and get more focused into um, B cells and T cells in terms of immune function, immune response, um, and understand how those two cell lines interact with each other. And then um, I want you to be able to apply this understanding of the immune system uh, in clinical settings. And specifically, I'll touch upon some things like pregnancy, vaccines, and the immune response um, in infants and young toddlers. So unfortunately, I cannot cover all of immunology in an hour. I'm happy to set up additional lectures on more specific details on immunology. If anybody uh, has any specific requests, just go ahead and have your department chief, your program director, or yourself email me um, at the Gmail link below. I'm a nerd and I love vaccines and vaccine science. It's actually where a lot of my uh, time has been spent. Um, so I tend to have a bias and view the immune system response as it pertains to interacting with vaccines. Um, I'm not a microbiologist. I'm also not an infectious disease doctor, so sorry. Um, I do talk about some categories of infections, um, but if somebody had a question about some specific type of bacteria or virus, I potentially am not going to be able to uh, get too deep into that. This lecture is skewed to help primary care clinicians better understand immunology. So my hope is that after this lecture, um, immunology will seem a little bit more um, relatable as it pertains to what you do every day. So the immune system, it's pretty obvious, what does it do? Uh, it recognizes pathogens or things that are non-self. And non-self can also include uh, tumor cells. So surveillance of tumor cells is actually a function of the immune system. It organizes a defense response uh, and it facilitates the actual destruction and elimination of pathogens. There's a lot of cells that are involved in the immune system. And I just put this slide up for a visual appreciation as to how uh, complex the immune system is. You can spend an entire semester talking about the immune system, um, and that is not my intent. When people think about um, the immune system, they oftentimes will just think about white blood cells, but really what's important is to think about the entire components of blood and how it pertains to immunity. So you've got the cells themselves, and Generally, you've got your mononuclear cells, and then you've got your poly, uh, polymorphonuclear cells, but you've also got serum proteins, uh, your immunoglobulins and complement factors, clotting factors. Uh, you've got cytokines that are chemicals that are just coursing through the blood. Um, so the immune system is more than just white blood cells. The immune system also has specific tissues and distribution. So one thing I don't like about this diagram is that it doesn't include the skin. 
Um, the skin is probably our greatest line of defense and skin is actually uh, an immune organ. So you have immune cells that are located within the skin, but you've also got things like your adenoids and your tonsils, um, your appendix. I mean, most people ignore it or they don't care if it's there. Um, I feel like the only people that really care about it uh, are immunologists because it's actually part of your immune system. You've also got your pyrus patches and your intestines. So you've got immune cells and, and, and lymphoid tissue distributed throughout your body. So I'm gonna, I like to talk about the immune system kind of comparing uh, a yin to a yang. And oftentimes I found that that's the easiest way for someone who's not an immunologist or not an infectious disease doctor to really uh, solidify their understanding of the immune system. So we're gonna start off talking about passive versus active immunity. Passive immunity is just the transfer of antibodies or immunoglobulins from one person's serum and it's being given to another person. Um, and I use antibody and immunoglobulin interchangeably um, just to prepare you for uh, some term switching. Now the downside of passive immunity is that it does not provide long-term immunity you are just giving someone some proteins that can help provide a certain defense, but proteins um, don't replicate themselves, and so eventually those proteins will degrade. Um, so with that, uh, a, a form of passive immune protection that all of us have uh, benefited from is passive protection through the umbilical cord from mother to child. Um, there is also some limited passive protection that comes through breast milk, but I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. Anybody who uh, does OB care is very familiar with Rogam. That is another form of passive protection. Um, and hyperimmune globulins are a way to render passive protection as well. So just to kind of make it a little um, current, uh, anybody who's keeping up with the scientific side of um, the discussion regarding COVID-19 is probably familiar with the fact that um, they have talked about taking convalescent serum from people who have uh, recovered from a COVID-19 infection. So they wanna take their antibodies and then passively transfer them to people who are very sick currently with COVID-19 in the hopes that that passive immune protection will help that person recover. And that is not the same as giving someone a vaccine, you're giving them a blood product that has kind of a, a, a limited lifetime or lifespan. However, the expectation is that by the time the person um, would have made their own antibodies, um, potentially the uh, morbidity and mortality associated with the infection would have overwhelmed the system. Other types of hyperimmune globulin that are used, so things like tetanus immune globulin, rabies immune globulin, uh, and also uh, HBIG, so hepatitis B immune globulin uh, that can be given to the infant of a mother who is hepatitis uh, B positive, and it's given shortly after birth. Generally, you have about seven days to administer that. So that's passive immune protection. And you got active immune protection, which is just that. It is stimulation of the immune system itself to have your own immune system create antigen-specific immunity. Um, and Usually active uh, immunity is either permanent or long-lived. And the reason why that is able to happen is because the active stimulation will create immune memory. How do we get active immunity? Well, our daily contact with pathogens and germs um, every day, but also things like active disease and vaccines. So vaccines take advantage of your active immune system to hopefully give you either permanent or long-lived immunity to whatever the vaccine is against. A little bit about innate versus adaptive immunity. So now we're just talking about the active part of the immune system. So innate immunity is hardwired. It is what you're born with, so to speak. It doesn't change, it doesn't get smarter, it's static. But your innate immune system is part of your early response. Um, the reason why I have a cartoon villain picture is because if anybody sees that picture, you know who the villain is in the cartoon. Usually he's got 
big eyebrows and can oftentimes have that seedy mustache and then he twirls the mustache. Oftentimes there are patterns that say to you, that's the bad guy in the cartoon. He's the villain. Well, your innate immune system also has the ability to recognize things in a similar pattern. Um, it, it has receptors that detect common signature surface markers of common invaders. So the innate immune system doesn't necessarily know, oh, I'm seeing this serotype of infection X, but it recognizes that's a villain just because I have in my, uh, you know, in my, in my bank um, receptors that just recognize villains. So I usually refer to innate immunity as off the rack. It is the same uh, no matter whether you buy it uh, when it first comes out or when it's on the clearance rack. There is nothing unique about it within your body. Now compare this to adaptive immunity. Adaptive immunity is acquired and it's expandable. It creates things like memory and recall of invaders. And it is unique for each person because even if two people live in the same household, it doesn't mean that in their day-to-day -day encounters, they are encountering the exact same pathogens every day. The downside of adaptive immunity though, is that it takes longer to respond. So this is your couture immunity. It's a little more nuanced. Um, it is fitted for you. It's fitted for what you encounter. Um, and when we talk about, oh, I'm gonna go back. Um, so when we talk about some of the components of immune response, um, there's a reason to have both innate immunity and adaptive immunity. You need your early responders, but you also want your body to have a long memory. So some of the cells of the innate immune system, you know, you've got your monocytes, macrophages, you've got your dendritic cells. Um, again, these cells are static. So you know, your, your monocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells, they interact with microbes and they secrete cytokines. So cytokines are chemicals that essentially wave a flag and say something's going on here. So if you equate that to something like a trending hashtag, you don't necessarily know the specifics based on the hashtag. All you know is that something's going on and your inflammatory cells need to go there. They can ingest and process and present antigens to T cells. Um, they are activated by T cells to then kill microbes and it uses things like complement, which I'll go into later, and antibodies to phagocytose or eat your microbes or your pathogens. You've also got innate cells called natural killer cells um, and these play a very important role in things like anti-tumor immunity and tumor surveillance. A little bit about complement, again, a complement lecture could take an hour, maybe two, maybe three, um, depending on how much you really wanna learn about it. But essentially, um, it's a system of soluble proteins that are in your serum that enhance or they complement the immune system clearance of damaged cells. So they can do several different functions. Um, they can kill microbes and lice or cut cells. Um, they can opsonize microbes for phagocytosis. And opsonization, the way I think about it, is it's like a kick me sign. So complement tags the pathogen with a kick me sign, and that tells the other cells of the immune system that that's the one that you wanna take down. Um, it's also involved in chemotaxis of monocytes and neutrophils. So kind of an immune system GPS, it tells them where to go, and it contributes to inflammation after tissue damage has occurred. So this is um, probably very uh, nausea inducing for a lot of folks as we think back on uh, some of our classroom time learning about immunity. Um, but an important part of the complement system is actually all the way down at the bottom. And so it's a very complex system, but the final complex of complement is with all of these proteins put together and it literally punches a hole in bacteria. So if you have a defect in complement and you are unable to create that hole punching defense, you actually have an impaired ability 
against encapsulated bacteria because you need to punch a hole in that outer coating. And if you can't punch holes in it, then that bacteria can win in that battle. So brief summary of the innate immune system. So you got your external mechanical barriers, because again, these things are static. They don't change, they don't get smarter. So things like stomach acid can be considered part of the innate immune system. You've got the receptors for pathogen motifs or patterns. So those are the things that just recognize this is a cartoon villain. You've also got your soluble proteins that don't get smarter over time, but those are the chemical signals um, that can alert the immune system as to who to take down or where to go um, in order to facilitate a response. So now we're gonna talk about um, humoral versus cell mediated immunity. And again, your humors are just your body fluid. And I always find it funny, I was like, humors, there's nothing funny about it. Um, but Hippocrates is credited with um, talking about the four humors, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. And historians believe that black bile is actually just decomposed blood that has darkened. Um, but when we think about our humoral immune system, it's the part of the immune system that exists in body fluids uh, versus cell mediated. So a lot of pathogens can enter a cell. Well, now you need something that can target specific cells that are infected and are no longer uh, identifiable as self. So a visual way to think about humoral versus cell mediated immunity, um, I usually like to talk about a hallway reference. So think of your hallway as the place where your body fluids are. So this is your intravascular space, for example. So your hallway is your humoral immune system. And there are things walking up and down the hallway. And if you see something in the hallway that isn't self, you get rid of it. But then, off the hallway are a bunch of rooms. Think of your specific cells as those rooms. So if I'm a humoral immune component, I never enter into the room. So if something evil is in the room, I kind of don't see it. It's a blind spot for me. Whereas my cell mediated uh, immune system doesn't pay much attention to what's in the hallway it pays more attention to what's in the room. And how does it know which rooms have a pathogen or have been infected? Well, that's because of something called a major histocompatibility complex or the MHC. So the MHC is like the, the door lock or a doorknob or even a do not disturb sign. So the MHC will present proteins to your T cells and it only is presenting proteins. So it doesn't present lipids or carbohydrates. And that's gonna be important when we talk about B and T cells. So T cells connect with part of your cell through MHC complexes. And you can present self proteins that say, we're all good in this room, or you can have impaired presentation or present non-self proteins. And that's what tells your T cells to go into that room and destroy the pathogen that's in that room. You've also got your mucosal immune system and a systemic immune system. And to put it simply, your mucosal surfaces, like your gut, your nose, it is in contact with foreign material all the time. Um, it's not a sterile environment. Nobody's nose is sterile. Nobody's gut is sterile. Um, but your mucosal immune system is generally going to be the first surface contact with invaders. That's a lot of times how they're going to enter your body. Um, so when we think about different routes of immunization, this is why there are some immunizations that can be given orally or intranasally, although intranasal flu is now uh, no longer supported by the Department of Defense, but that's an issue we're not going to get into. Um, but you can administer a vaccination through the mucosal surface, and then that provides mucosal immunity. Systemic immunity, on the other hand, is in locations like your uh, CSF or your blood, environments that are usually sterile, and your systemic immunity or, or immune system 
really needs to protect your critical organs like your heart, your brain, your liver. Um, so when you give an injected vaccine, you're going to get a bigger systemic response than mucosal response because of the mode of administration. Um, and this is kind of a way to think about it, knowing that there's gonna be some level of overlap. So for some diseases, it's better to have systemic immunity. For other diseases, it's better to have mucosal immunity. And in some cases, you wanna have both. So yellow fever is an example of a disease that does not infect a mucosal surface. You get yellow fever because of a mosquito bite. So it's not because somebody coughs on you. It's not because you ate something. It's because you got a, a mosquito bite with an infected mosquito in a yellow fever risk area. So you don't need mucosal immunity for yellow fever. So there's never gonna be a reason to create an oral yellow fever vaccine because you don't need it. Rotavirus, on the other hand, is a GI infection. So anybody who gives immunizations to children, specifically infants, or anybody who has an infant will probably remember that your baby got rotavirus uh, a vaccine and it was given orally. Well, rotavirus only infects the gut. So you don't need to make a rotavirus injection you just need to give it orally because the only place where you need immune protection is in your mucosal surface. Then you've got diseases like influenza and polio. So influenza enters the body through your mucosal membrane, but oftentimes where the greatest damage is done is at the systemic level. Um, polio is transmitted through fecal oral routes and polio should be thought of firsthand and foremost as a gut infection. However, that virus can then cross and become systemic and then people can get paralytic polio. So I'm old and when I was a child, I got oral polio vaccination. Well, the downside is that the oral vaccine will shed virus in the stool. So in North America, we have eradicated polio, knock on wood. Um, and so the risks of giving it orally were too high. So that's why we now get polio injectable vaccinations to help protect people from the overwhelming systemic uh, complications that can be seen. But in some countries where there is still wild type polio, it is better to give the oral vaccine because you're maximizing your mucosal protection and that's how it enters the body. And I hope this kind of helps make sense when people look at, at different vaccines um, and think about the why. You know, why is it important that people um, get a, a flu shot? Not because we don't want people to get runny nose, congestion, and mild fever. We don't want people to get the systemic complications that can go along with flu. So this is a quad chart that outlines um, how there's some overlap. So you've got your innate immune system can have cellular components and also humoral components like complement. And your adaptive immune system also has cellular and humoral components. And in particular, I'm, I, I, I fangirl T cells and B cells and how they interact because it's so important to immune memory. Um, so hopefully by the end of my talk, people will also feel that love. Um, so we've talked about the innate immune system, which is on the left-hand side. We're going to talk about the adaptive immune system, but as painful as this graphic is to look at, um, hopefully you guys get my visual examples and you walk away looking at this and suddenly feeling a little more confident to explain the different uh, uh, modes of adaptive immunity. So we're going to talk practical details. and. The way my brain processes things, it's very uh, visual, kind of cartoony, um, because that's how I remember things. So brief review from three slides ago. Um, humoral immunity, think B cells. B cells, they mature in the bone marrow, and the B in B cell actually isn't for bone marrow, um, but everybody associates it with B for bone marrow. Um, your B cells are what produce antibodies or immunoglobulins. 
Again, humoral immunity. So think walking in the hallway. They tackle extracellular bacteria and they can recognize it as a native antigen. So they can see the entirety of the pathogen in the hallway and know it's not good. T cells are cell mediated and they mature in an organ called the thymus. Now the T in T cell actually is because of thymus. Um, there's a lot of subtypes of T cells. I'm not gonna go into details because again, my goal is not to make you an immunologist, but to make you feel comfortable with the immune system. Your T cells recognize processed antigen. So remember we talked about the MHC? That's the, that's the door lock or the sign on the door. Well, it presents a protein component of whatever's in that cell. And that's the only way that T cells recognize antigen. It must be presented in an MHC. So the T cell can just walk up the hallway and a whole antigen goes flying past. T cells don't keep walking. T cell sees something on the door and it's a part of an antigen, that's what it's gonna recognize. Your T cells are very important in fighting viruses, fungi, and then anything that's intracellular. Now, I've mentioned immunoglobulins, and I said I would get back to the discussion about breast milk. So, not all immunoglobulins are created equal. This is a focus on two specific kinds of uh, immunoglobulins or antibodies. You've got IgA and you've got IgG. So, IgA is what's in secretions. This is what's in your tears. This is what is in breast milk. And it's part of your mucosal immune system. So IgA works before the pathogen enters into systemic circulation. The downside of IgA though is that it doesn't live very long. Its half-life is only about six days. And IgA is primarily excreted. And once it's excreted, your body then doesn't absorb it and make it systemic. Why is this important? Because if a pregnant person, pregnant woman, um, says, I don't wanna get the flu shot, I'll get it after I deliver because I'm going to breastfeed. Breast milk only has IgA, and what you want to render is systemic immunity in that baby. And you want the baby to have IgG. So while breast milk does serve a very important role in growth and also maturation of the immune system, the IgA that is in that breast milk only lasts a couple of days and it doesn't get systemically absorbed. So IgG is, prim is our primary systemic antibody. Um, it has the longest half-life. It's got a longer half-life than IgM or IgE and it crosses the placenta. IgG is the only antibody that crosses the placenta. When people talk about hyperimmunoglobulins, they are only talking about IgG, and that's why I included it here, because um, across the board, it is our most important immunoglobulin. A Little bit about the fetal immune system and development. So you've got hematopoietic cells um, that develop over time, um, depending on the stages of gestation. And these are the cells that really create your, you know, your red blood cells, and your white blood cells. So early in gestation, there is innate immune capacity. So that is your early responders, your static responders. Thymic development, which is where you get your T cells, begins during the first trimester. And humoral immune system or B cell development is not fully functional until after an infant is born. And I insert here, like a little bell should ring regarding some board exam uh, uh, related areas um, because that's an important distinction to understand. When an infant is born, their B cells still have to mature. Whereas when you're born, your T cells and your innate immune cells are functional from the time you were born. Let me bring my cursor down to advance the slide. Okay. Oh, okay. So passive immunity in the newborn. So transplacental transfer of IgG, because remember, that's the only antibody that can cross the placenta. It primarily happens during the last two months of pregnancy. 
So the last two months of pregnancy is when it's basically that's the fattening period where you start to build stores. You build stores of fat. The fetus builds stores of iron. And you also build stores of antibody, IgG. So at the time of delivery, a term infant's IgG repertoire is equal to the maternal IgG. You are born with whatever passively was received from mom. Um, and that maternal IgG actually is protected from degradation. So the immune system knows, okay, these B cells, they're gonna take a couple of months to mature. So don't degrade maternal IgG in that 23 to 28 day window. Let's make it last longer. So it actually is protected and can last in the baby's bloodstream longer than your own innate made immunoglobulin. So when we think about passive protection in a newborn, maternal IgG can last for months. Uh, as I already said, IgA is in breast milk and it can give some protection in the GI tract, but it's not gonna be systemically absorbed. So again, we're gonna talk B cell versus T cell, B cell versus T cell, humoral immunity versus cell mediated immunity. Your B cells are making your immunoglobulins and extracellular bugs are their target. I already said, there's a lot of different kinds of T cells, but I'm gonna talk about the two main types. You've got your cytotoxic T cell, which is also called your killer cell, and then you've got your helper T cell. So whoever decided to name these, they kind of made it straightforward. Killer T cells kill and helper T cells help. Helper T cells don't kill, they only help. They help the B cell. Um, but again, T cells, are only able to kill intracellular bugs, and they are only able to see what is presented on an MHC complex. So a T cell can only recognize a protein that's presented to it. Now, once it attacks that cell, it'll attack everything in that cell, um, and it'll direct other cells to come, but it only knows that that cell is infected or is non-self, so maybe it's a tumor cell, by seeing protein antigen presented on that MHC. And I've already said, you know, the, the thymus, I think of it as a pediatric organ, um, but that's the site of your T-cell maturation. Now, anybody who's ever done a NICU rotation knows that when you do a chest X-ray of a newborn, the thymus in a newborn is huge, and it atrophies over time. And ding, 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 for anybody who might be taking a pediatric board exam, this is another area that's ripe for question, is being able to identify what might be a T cell immune deficiency. So T cell immunodeficiencies are not compatible with life in an infant. So it is gonna be something that presents early and it's oftentimes going to present before six months of age. Whereas B cell immune deficiencies will present later because the immune system already knows the B cells aren't that smart, not in the beginning. Um, so severe combined immune deficiency or SCID uh, requires intervention within the first three months of life. Otherwise it's going to result in a fatality. Um, but this is why there is an addition in most uh, newborn uh, screening tests to try to identify babies that don't have functional T cells. So TREX are essentially the shreds of paper after a T cell's been made. So think of a T cell like a snowflake, paper snowflake. You got all these little shreds of paper, and if you don't have shreds of paper, it means you didn't make a snowflake, you didn't make a T cell. So if you don't have TREX, that's very concerning that you don't have a thymus and you haven't been making T cells. Again, I'm very visual. I do a lot of frequency hopping. We're gonna talk a little bit now about memory. And this is why your B cells and your T cells are so important. They are your primary memory creating cells. So a naive B cell can become either a plasma cell, and plasma cells are what actually secrete antibodies, or they can become a memory cell. So your memory cells don't actually secrete antibody, they just hang out. They hang out and they wait to be told that they need to become plasma cells and make more antibody. But a memory B cell inherently just kind of kicks back and it's just waiting. It's not making any antibody. 
um, whereas your plasma cells are actually putting the antibodies into your bloodstream. But, you know, as long lived as your plasma cells are, sometimes your plasma cells are like, all right, we've been making this antibody for for years now and we haven't encountered this infection. So we're just going to hang up and we're going to go and, and decompose. Well, this is why certain things require boosters. So your booster is going to trigger memory cells to make more plasma cells. And then they are the ones that are going to be secreting antibodies. So when people look at, you know, your titer level, just because your titer level or your antibody level is going down, it doesn't mean you, you have fewer memory cells. You, in fact, have memory cells. How do you know you have memory cells? Because you used to have a higher titer. Um, but titers go down over time because your plasma cells, if they're not encountering anything and they feel like they're just kind of hanging out for no reason, they'll just stop making their antibody. You also have memory T cells. Um, now, one of the things that's important to know, so I've already talked about how T cells are important to fight viral infections, but when we do blood testing for titers, we are not looking directly for T cell memory. We're looking for antibody levels and antibodies are made by B cells. So your viral memory relies on having memory T cells, but we indirectly measure it by doing antibody titers. So some people are considered, quote, hepatitis B vaccine non-responders. Well, the problem is that our commercial testing isn't testing T cells. Now, one of the ways to verify that someone's a, quote, non-responder is that you give them more of the vaccine. You're hoping to trigger those memory B cells to make more plasma cells and then make more antibody. But you have no way to directly measure your memory T cells to know, hey, if I get exposed to hepatitis B or if I get exposed to varicella, am I really susceptible to infection? Um, but that's part of the, the reason why when we look at some titer levels, it isn't necessarily an accurate reflection of what the true immune system memory is. But there's no commercial way to go and do T cell memory testing. Um, maybe someone in here is super smart and they're going to discover that. And then you're welcome because I just gave you an idea that will help uh, hopefully clarify some of these hepatitis B non-responders um, and just say thank you when you get your Pulitzer Nobel Prize. All right. Again, I'm a visual person and I think very simple. We're going to talk about how your B cell and your T cell interact and it'll help understand why measuring an antibody titer is a pretty good way to assess viral immune response and T cell memory. So Batman and Robin. Now, again, I said I'm really old. So this is what I remember as Batman and Robin. Um, I know there have been like 800 different Batmans, and then Robin had his own spinoff. Um, but we're going to talk old school. Uh, so Bruce Wayne is Batman. B-cell, Batman. And then Robin is your helper T-cell. Like I said, helper T-cells help, but they're not cytotoxic. They don't kill. They're not killer T-cells. If they were killer T-cells, then they'd be killer T-cells, but they're helpers. So Robin helps Batman. But Batman, even without Robin, can kill. Um, but he can kill more effectively if Robin's there helping him out. So now that you guys have my fourth grade <laughs> kind of uh, way to, to keep them, them straight, I'm not saying you guys are fourth graders, but like I said, this is how I remember it. Um, everything I say will hopefully make much more sense. So B cell activation. There's two ways for B cells to be activated. They can either depend on a T cell or they can be independent. So you can have Batman and Robin or just, just Batman. That's my Batman impersonation. I know it's terrible. Um, so T cell dependent, it is B cell activation with the help of a helper T cell. But here's the catch. Your T cells can only see what's on an MHC and that means it can only see proteins. But once it identifies, 
hey, this is a bad guy, your B cells can see things other than proteins. And so that's why you can have responses to other things besides just protein antigens. When you do B cells with T cell help, you get a very strong immune response. This is also where you get the vast majority of your isotype switching. So you go from making IgM to then having cells that will secrete IgG or IgA or even IgE. And as an allergist, I also am a fan of IgE, but we're not gonna talk about IgE today. This is how most of your memory cells are made. B cell activation with the help of T cell in identifying where the invaders are. This is why antibody titers are a pretty good correlate that you have T cell memory. T cell independent B cell activation. This is how your body responds to polysaccharides or lipids or nucleic acids that are foreign pathogens. So your polysaccharides, that's your, that's your candy coating, that's your sugars. And then you got your fats and then you have your nucleic acid. But when the B cell is activated, independent of T cells, you get little to no isotype switching. And what you do get, it's mostly gonna be IgG. Um, some antigens like polysaccharides can actually create B cell memory on their own. Um, but if you think back, when I talked about the infant's immune system, B cells take months to really mature. So when a baby's born, their B cells aren't very good responders. And that means that in young children, they're going to have a harder time responding to polysaccharide or encapsulated pathogens. Well, that's why maternal antibodies are so important because if an infant can't really make their own B cell independent antibodies, well, mom's full adult repertoire of antibodies fill that gap until the infant's immune system is able to build it on its own and to make active immune responses. So T cell independent, why do you need it? Well, because there's a lot of bad bacteria with carbohydrate or polysaccharide or fat on the surface, your T cells will not recognize it. You need Batman alone to be able to fight those invaders. Um, so Batman can fight without Robin and you need it because some of your kind of a bacteria that can be thought of as, as devastating because they have a polysaccharide or encapsulated coat are things like meningi uh, the meningococcal bacteria. That has a polysaccharide coating. So you want B cells because you don't wanna just walk around susceptible to things like meningitis. Some vaccines, because remember, I'm a nerd and I really love vaccines. Some vaccines are polysaccharide vaccines. So Pneumovax, different from Prevnar, Pneumovax is a polysaccharide vaccine. Pneumovax is for adults, but the reason why you can give it to children after the age of two isn't because it's dangerous to give to someone younger than two, it's a polysaccharide. The infant's immune system doesn't really have great B cells in the beginning, and they're just not going to respond to it. That's why if you ever see a vaccine where it specifically says you can't give it under the age of two, that is tied to it being a polysaccharide vaccine. Typhoid vaccine is another example of a polysaccharide vaccine. So you don't give it to someone under two because they're just not going to respond. So they're T cell independent. All good. All great, right? Um, a lot of this I've talked about already, um, but when you are counseling parents about immunizations, either during pregnancy or during the first six months of life, here are some pearls that you will now feel confident explaining when you counsel that family about the reasons why immunization, according to schedule, is so important. So if a pregnant woman receives pertussis immunization and flu immunization during their third trimester, they are going to have a spike in their IgG. 
Well, that's also when most IgG transfer happens to the baby. So you want to time it so that you are maximizing what the baby receives in terms of passive protection. Um, if an infant is born prematurely, they're not going to benefit as much from the passive transfer. So it's actually even more important to make sure that preterm infants get vaccinated according to schedule because they missed out on weeks and weeks of building up a passive repertoire of protection. Um, the majority of this passive protection is gone around six months of life. So we know about, we talked about polio and polio infections are historically considered childhood infections. Because by the time you were the age of five, during the time of polio, most people had already been exposed and had their own active immunity. But what was interesting is that polio wasn't really seen in infants under six months of age. That was because of maternal passive protection. So when you look at the timing in the schedule of vaccinations during the first six months of life, they're given at two months, four months, six months. Why do you want to stay on schedule? Because you want the baby to be making their own antibody around the same time as the maternal antibody protection starts to wane. Again, IgG and breast milk can provide some GI tract protection, but it's not getting systemically absorbed. So breastfeeding is wonderful. It's important to help mature the immune system but nothing takes the place of maximizing maternal IgG and maximizing staying on schedule during the first six months of life for an infant being vaccinated. So your T cells are fully functional, um, your B cells not completely functional, children under two are gonna have impaired production because their B cells are not quite fully matured yet. So again, polysaccharides, encapsulated bacteria can be very dangerous to young infants. So when we think about haemophilus influenza type B, pneumococcal infections and meningococcal infections, those are all encapsulated bacteria. Asplenic patients are also more susceptible. So the spleen is an immune organ and it's really important in the B cells that are the best at being Batman without Robin. So if you don't have a spleen, you have impaired Batmen. I guess the plural of Batman is Batman. Um, that's why there are vaccine recommendations for asplenic patients or patients who are going to have their spleens removed. You want to kind of knock on the window of those memory B cells and be like, hey, memory B cell. So remember that time I created you to fight against Haemophilus influenza type B? So we're going to be losing our spleen. So I just want to boost what plasma cells are out there because I want to maximize how many antibodies against these encapsulated bacteria we have floating around. Because once spleen is gone, spleen is gone, and I have impaired Batman. Conjugate vaccines, however, are a workaround. So again, anybody who vaccinates infants, you're like, well, wait, there's a hip vaccine. You just said you can't respond. So why? Conjugate vaccines are the workaround. So when you take a protein and you conjugate it with a polysaccharide, so it's the chocolate plus the peanut butter, you put the sugar and the protein together, bam, that infant's immune system and their T cells, they're going to see the protein. And then when it's working with the B cell, the B cells that are functional are going to be able to create antibody responses because it was Batman plus Robin. So conjugate vaccines are the loophole to allow infants to produce antibody types to encapsulated bacteria. So anybody who's having like an aha, like, oh, that's what a conjugate vaccine is. Now you're welcome. Uh, so infants will have limited active immunity. We've already kind of hit on a, a lot of this, but a lot of that passive protection gone by six months of age. So important pearls. If you take away nothing else, fully immunized pre-pregnant women is so important, not just for the mother, so she is healthy during her pregnancy, but to maximize the benefits 
that she gives to the infant. So if the guidelines say you can give your pertussis containing vaccine as soon as 28 weeks, you kind of want to get on board as close to 28 weeks because if you give a pertussis containing vaccine and then three days later she has the baby, you potentially didn't take advantage of all the pertussis antibody being transferred. The guidelines are oftentimes given to maximize the benefit to the infant um, after delivery. So delaying influenza or pertussis vaccination misses a very critical window. And preterm infants, again, they don't get the full 40 weeks of, of exposure and those full two months in the final trimester of building up their repertoire. So unless you have a severely premature infant, in which case their size and weight factor into the ability to give the vaccine. But let's say you have a 30 weeker. Okay, 30 weeker. So, you know, I used to be a pediatrician. So I was like, 30 weeker, you're good. All the organs are good. We'll, we'll help mature your lungs, but you're probably gonna do really well. You want to make sure that that 30 week infant is staying on target with their immunizations because they missed out on the repertoire build. So you're, uh, oh, I've hit on these. Okay. Oh, so why is this important? Um, another thing that uh, I always want to make sure people understand is that maternal antibodies can interfere with replication of live viral vaccines and the immune response may not occur because the maternal antibody turns off any kind of inflammatory reaction to that live viral vaccine. So when people look at things like MMR and varicella vaccines, the reason why you wait until the 12 month mark isn't because they wanna make it hard on everybody. It's actually because components like the measles component highly sensitive to being deactivated by maternal antibodies. So if, let's say you have a child who's gonna travel or there's a measles outbreak and that baby is under 12 months, but over six months, you are recommended to give them a measles containing vaccine, but you don't count it because you don't know if there's still maternal antibody hanging around that's turning it off and it doesn't take much. So when a parent, comes in and they're at the nine month window and they're like, can we just get our MMR and varicella now just because I'd rather do it now? The reason why is it's probably not gonna work as a vaccine. So it defeats the purpose unless there's an outbreak in which case CDC guidelines will take precedent. Oral vaccines though are not as sensitive because again, you've got maternal IgG in the system, but you're doing oral vaccines to stimulate your mucosal immunity and IgG is floating around systemically. So rotavirus is a live vaccine, but it's not gonna be inactivated by maternal passive protection. So these are some summary points. Like I said, I wanted to stick as close to a 50 minute lecture as possible. Um, a few little like nuggets. So things like tetanus. Tetanus, there's no such thing as herd immunity to tetanus. So you want to make sure that people are protected against things like tetanus because in some places in the world, um, neonatal tetany uh, still exists. But if you vaccinate and a woman before she even gets pregnant is immune to tetanus, guess what will not happen? That infant will not get neonatal tetany because it is passed on from mother to infant passively. But if everybody in the community is vaccinated against tetanus, except for the mother, there's no such thing as herd immunity with some diseases. Um, delayed vaccination schedules, it's counterintuitive because now you guys know how an infant's immune system takes time to develop its B cells. Um, and commercial titer testing only looks at immunoglobulin levels. So not a T cell memory direct measure, but it's a pretty good indirect measure. All right, so now I'm gonna open it up for any questions. So I see, oh, someone, uh, Sikong Wang said, aha. Um, I used to have a slide in the deck that had that aha moment when all of a sudden anyone who does pediatric care was like, that's the reason why children under two who are not immunized are more susceptible to things like Hib meningitis. Um, 
and also um, why the vaccine works because it's a conjugate vaccine. So any any questions? Feel free to type them in the chat room. I don't. Okay, so we've got a couple people typing. And that's my email address. So if anybody is uh, the come up with um, a question after the fact, feel free to send me an email. I'm more than happy to share whatever knowledge I can share and get primary care clinicians to feel more confident talking about the immune system, immunology, and vaccines. Um, and if anybody wants any additional immunology based lectures or even allergy lectures because you know rhinitis it's kind of common all right so yes correct both so humoral and cellular immunity are when you talk about your b cells and your t cells those are all parts of your active immune system passive immune system or passive immunity is where somebody else's antibody is given to you Active immunity is where your body, your immune system responds to um, something itself. Yes, so Synergis, that's a great example of passive immune protection. Now, Synergis is not pooled antibody. It's, it's a monoclonal antibody. A lot of people think of Synergis as a vaccine. So anybody who doesn't understand what I'm talking about when I'm talking about Synergis. So Synergis is administered to protect infants from RSV infection. And RSV is seasonal, just like the flu. RSV can be devastating to children with certain medical histories or medical conditions. So premature infants, children with congenital heart disease, you do not want that baby getting RSV. So during RSV season, you start giving them passive protection by giving them synergists. A lot of people think of synergists as a vaccination. Vaccinations render long-term immune memory. Synergist doesn't stick around. It's passive protection. That's why these children have to come in on a regular basis during the RSV season. And if the child, the next RSV season, is still considered at risk, that's why they have to get synergist again during each RSV season. Whereas with the flu, the reason you get the flu shot is because the flu shot, the flu virus can mutate and it looks different. So yes, you still have your memory cells from the 2012 vaccine, but if the 2020 virus looks different, you gotta get a flu shot every year because it mutates. But Synergis is passive immune protection, not the same as a vaccine. Any other questions? That was a good point to bring up. Nobody else typing? All right, so as I said at the beginning, I am not Adobe Connect savvy. So I've been recording this and over the weekend, I'm gonna figure out how to share the video because the Adobe Connect room had a ceiling on who could come in, who could participate. So for folks like Dr. Meisenheimer, um, I will share that with you so you can share that with your residents um, and spread the knowledge. Um, but do that being socially distant and um, staying six feet away. Nothing like virtual learning. And so with that, thank you everybody for joining me on this wonderful Friday. Please stay safe, stay socially distant, look out for one another, but look out for one another virtually because it's a really challenging time for everybody in the medical field. And with that, I'm going to end the lecture.